Welcome to the launch event for Greenpeace Australia Pacific Report. Te mana o te moana, the state of the climate in the Pacific 2020. Presented by the Sydney Environment Institute and Greenpeace Australia Pacific. Before we begin today's proceedings, I would like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, at least virtually. It is upon their ancestral lands that the University of Sydney is built. As we share our knowledge, teaching, learning, and research practices within the university, may we also pay respect to the knowledge forever embedded within the Australian Aboriginal custodianship of country. My name is Susan Park, and I am a professor of global governance here at the University of Sydney and a research lead on Unsettling Resources Project at the Sydney Environment Institute. Our research seeks to identify how we can decarbonize and move to a just environmental transition using renewable resources. The Sydney Environment Institute is a global leader in multidisciplinary environmental research. We bring together key thinkers from across the university and beyond to address critical environmental challenges. Today's event is in partnership with Greenpeace Australia Pacific, who cover Australia, Papua New Guinea, Fiji, Samoa, and 15 other island nations of the Pacific, including countries that are highly vulnerable to climate change, like Kiribati, Vanuatu, and Tuvalu. Greenpeace is an environmental campaigning organization dedicated to securing an earth capable of nurturing life in all of its magnificent diversity. It is synonymous with the Pacific's history of struggle against environmental degradation from the nuclear days to now. Greenpeace is a fully independent organization, free of vested interests and accepts no funding from any government, business or political party. Today, the expert behind, experts behind Greenpeace's landmark report will provide the latest analysis of how the world is progressing on the aims of the Paris Agreement on Climate Change and share some of the stories of the Pacific Island people on the front lines of the fight for their communities and planet. So what I'd like to do today is first introduce our speakers and then give them time to present their work. We will then have time for questions and answers and then hear from, uh, from the CEO of Greenpeace Australia Pacific. So what I would like you to do as you listen to our speakers today, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and we will take them up at question time. So I'd like to introduce our four speakers today. First, we have Joseph Mawiono Kalio. He is from Falafa and Mali, Samoa, and is Greenpeace head of Pacific. Joe is a member of the Pacific Climate Warriors, having co-founded its Wellington branch in 2018 and has continued to build coalitions between governments and civil society to drive campaigns in the Pacific and internationally. Dr. Nicola Kashul is Greenpeace's Head of Research and Investigations. He has been instrumental in successful campaigns on the renewable energy target, protecting the Great Barrier Reef, Adani and Mool. Genevieve Jeeva is from Suva, Fiji, and a youth advocate for stronger action on the climate crisis. She is the coordinator for the Pacific Islands Climate Action Network and the Pacific Regional Node of CAN International. And we have the CEO of Greenpeace Australia, David Ritter, who will provide some closing comments at the end. I would like to now turn to Joe to reflect on the purpose and the urgency of the report and its intended outcomes. Over to you, Joe. Earlier this week, 15 Pacific leaders published an editorial calling on Scott Morrison to honour the international climate commitments Australia has made and the commitments it has made to its Pacific neighbours. With the launch of this report today, we add our voice to that growing chorus. At every level, from villages to faith communities to civil society and all the way up to government, the Pacific has continued to be the moral voice in this crisis through not only our current experience, but through the force of our example. As you will see in the report, we contribute less than 1% of global emissions, and yet we are the first to go 100% renewable, the first to ratify the Paris Agreement, and among other strides forward, 
have already started submitting updated NDCs. Even so, the Pacific cannot save the planet on its own, especially when one of its own, Australia, refuses to do its part. The fact is climate change is no longer a distant threat for us in the Pacific. We do not speak of it in future tense because it is our daily uh, lived reality now. And as we saw with the recent fires, it's now a part of the daily Australian reality too. This doesn't have to be the norm if we take heed of these report findings and take action. And that begins when Australian leaders start showing the same moral fortitude and political will as the rest of the Pacific. Now, this we realize won't happen without a little push. Pacific leaders have said that climate change is the single greatest threat to the security and prosperity of the region. And so to that end, we took that as our cue and began looking at how we as a global organization can maneuver ourselves into an alignment with the region's priorities and leverage our reach for maximum impact. And as we are an organization whose remit covers both Australia and the wider region, we are also in a unique position of having both the hero and the villain within our sphere of operations. So a quick overview of the campaign. Uh, in 2019, we began as one should when seeking to work in the Pacific. We went out into the region. We placed ourselves at the feet of elders who through their traditional knowledge, uh, deepened our own understanding of movement building and the role of stewardship. We fostered key relationships, met with Pacific government leaders and stakeholders. And through this foundational work, we learned a great deal about the true meaning of solidarity and brought our work into closer alignment with the Pacific's ethos of environmental stewardship. And then through this process, we also identified four key areas where we could support the Pacific's climate action efforts and maximize the impact of our work in the region. The first key area is political engagement and support. Political uh, Pacific leaders have been quite vocal at this level despite all the geopolitical challenges. So it was important for us to support their efforts to build partnerships at all levels and build broad multi-state coalitions to leverage against the big polluters at global forums. Uh, this means providing support at regional and UNFCCC uh, negotiations it also includes our work on climate litigation, which for obvious reasons I can't get too much into, um, but only to say that we are working with uh, Pacific governments to develop a legal pathway towards uh, climate justice. The second area is on mobilizations and actions, supporting local groups, building our grassroots capability through, throughout Australia and the Pacific Islands, harnessing the collective power of people by orchestrating key mobilization moments across the world uh, and within the Pacific. Obviously, due to COVID, a lot of this work is being deferred to next year, uh, which is particularly exciting, uh, exciting given the key moments that are likely to go ahead uh, in the new year. The third area has been a more intentional look at the narratives that have been presented about the Pacific, looking at these narratives, reframing them and presenting a more holistic look at the Pacific. So the communications, media and storytelling stream has allowed us to amplify the voices from the front lines, changing outdated and extractive narratives of the region. And put simply, it's our people telling our stories. We're more than just broken sea walls and cyclones and there is much in the traditional wisdom of our communities that can instill hope in the movement and drive the region's climate action. Uh, we were able to get Pacific leaders to present these narratives to global media cycles since August last year, and this eventually got uh, underneath Scott Morrison's skin so much that he had to uh, address it midway through a press conference during COP25 last year. That's a sign that consistent pressure through a sophisticated media strategy and highly engaging digital storytelling is effective. And then finally, we come to the fourth stream, which is uh, research and investigations. As we began mapping out the work, we realized that we needed the best available information, the latest scientific data, political currents and stories researched and collected in collaboration with regional partners in order to better inform all our work and provide a policy bedrock for all our advocacy. And so that result, that, that last stream resulted in uh, commissioning the report that we are launching today, the aims of which are to demonstrate the extent of the climate crisis facing the Pacific, to quantify who is responsible, who is most responsible for this crisis. And we approach that through an analysis of the commitments major carbon emitting nations have made in light of the Paris Agreement and their progress towards them. And then to finally, to put a, to put a human face on the crisis. This was important to us as 
uh, all too often this issue becomes little more than a buzzword to many people or a political football thrown around by ideologues. But this is at its heart an issue about people and what kind of world we want our children to inherit. So through the case studies, we examine that and these case studies uh, tell the stories of effective Pacific communities and foreground um, those communities' demands for action on climate mitigation and adaptation. So that was a look at the context within which the report is situated. And with that, I'll, I'll hand back over to you, Susan, to introduce you to the authors uh, and to take us through the report. Thank you very much, Joe, for being able to provide that context on the need for the report. Um, perhaps I can now turn to Nicola to uh, give us um, an outline of the data within the report, which can help us construct a picture of what exactly the countries um, which countries uh, should be held to account for their high emissions. So over to you, Nicola. Thank you, Susan. And before I start, let me say thank you so much to everybody that's joined this call. We have 140 people on this call, which is a fantastic result. Uh, and also just a big thanks to the Sydney Environment Institute for hosting us today. Um, I'm incredibly proud of the report. Together with Genevieve Jiva, who you will hear from right after me, I'm one of the authors of the report. Um, and, uh, you know, I think... Uh, it is something that uh, will shape the debate in, in days to come, hopefully, and, and you know, weeks and months to come. Um, one of the things that we're all most proud of is that this is not a report where you know, white Australians tell the Pacific what to do. And it is both um, driven by the experiences of Pacific Island people, as well as uh, has, you know, done in collaboration with the people of the Pacific. It is very much of the Pacific, not for or to the Pacific. And in that light, before I start into some of the more detailed elements of the you know, emissions data and things like that, I'd like to read out the preface of the report, uh, which is a poem by Albert Wendt, who some of you may know as a Samoan-born uh, literary figure, poet, uh, and one of the um, you know, greatest Pacific living literary figures. Uh, it really sets the scene for what we're talking about. So if you'll indulge me for a minute, I'll, I'll read it out. For those of you that have seen the report, it's already, it's in there in the preface. But uh, here we go. The poem is called and so it is, and uh, Mr. Went graciously allowed us to include it as part of the, the um, report. We want so many things and much. What is real and not? What is the plan? Our garden is an endless performance of light and shadow, quick bird and insect palaver. The decisive wisdom of cut basil informs everything, teaches even the black rocks of the back divide to breathe. Blessed are the flowers, herbs, and vegetables Raina has planted in their healing loveliness. The hibiscus blooms want a language to describe their color. I say the red of fresh blood or birth. A lone monarch butterfly flits from flower to flower. How temporary it all is, how fleeting the attention. The boundary palm with the gigantic afro is a fecund nest for the squabble of birds that wake us in the mornings. In two weeks of luscious rain and heat, our lawn is a wild scramble of green that wants no limits. Into the breathless blue sky, the Puhatekawa in the corner of our backyard stretches and stretches. Invisible in its foliage, a warbler weaves a delicate song I want to capture and remember, like I try to hold all the people I've loved or love as they disappear into the space before memory. Yesterday, I pulled up the compost lid to a buffet of delicious decay and fat worms feasting. Soil, earth is our return, our last need and answer beyond addictive reason, fear and desire. Despite all else, the day will fulfill its cycle of light and dark, and I'll continue to want much and take my chances. Very powerful and I think really sets the scene for, for where we are and what we're talking about. So let's, let me uh, talk about some of the specifics. So as Joe said, uh, we looked at, uh, you know, who is responsible for the crisis the Pacific finds itself in and what do we need to do about it, essentially. At the moment, we are at 1.1 degrees of global heating. And already the Pacific is suffering huge impacts uh, on its people and the very ability of them to survive on the islands uh, where they live. Uh, Genevieve will speak more to this after me, so I'm not going to go into that except to say that even at 1.1 degrees, the impacts are significant. So who is responsible? Well, here on this table, uh, we have the top 15 annual emitters in the world. 
this is data from 2016 uh, because we don't have uh, data for every single country uh, right up to 2020. We have some for some and not for others. So if we look, we, we're using data where we have it all available. It should be said that the 2016 emissions numbers will be lower than they are now because the emissions trajectory has not improved since 2016. So if anything, these numbers are a little bit conservative. But what you can see there is, is as expected, perhaps China is by far the biggest with 23% uh, sorry, of the global total, followed shortly by the US at 11.8%, then India, the EU, Russia, and so on. Uh, Australia is 14th at 1.05%, but we are also the world's biggest per capita emitter in the OECD and the world's biggest coal exporter. And really the injustice of this situation is apparent in that gray section at the bottom here where you can see me pointing to with the cursor. These top 15 emitters together emit 73.51% of all annual emissions on planet Earth. 14 of them have ratified the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Iran has signed it but has not ratified it. And 14 Pacific Island countries have also ratified that convention. Together, they produce 0.14% of all global emissions annually at the moment. And so you can see there, there is an incredible injustice in the way that the responsibility for these emissions are spread around the globe. Those least responsible for it are, are bearing the biggest impacts at the moment. Here, I won't dwell on these graphs too long. This is just another way of representing those numbers from 1990 to 2016. Uh, this is you know, annual emissions, um, and so you see for each country. And the biggest trend, I suppose, is China, which is the yellow line. You know, as China industrialized in, over the 90s and 2000s, uh, its, its emissions have gone right up uh, there to almost 12 gigatons uh, per year. Um, Australia's is relatively, it looks relatively stable. It's the blue line at the bottom. Um, but, uh, you know, because the scale is quite small, it actually masks some, some spikes that have gone up and down in that time. And again, here we have a similar chart, just the same data represented in another way. So the next question we asked is, well, what are the nationally determined contributions of these countries? So what are the emissions reductions that they have pledged to have? And they're listed here. I won't go through them all. What is more important is to say, how sufficient are they to keep global warming to below 1.5 degrees? Um, do these countries have policies in place to meet them? So first, how sufficient are those NDCs? Well, we've divided them up into five different categories, and this is uh, you know, due uh, with some credit to Climate Action Tracker that have done a fair bit of this work that we based our report on in this section. So for one, a category, the worst is critically insufficient. What does this mean? Well, this means that if every single country had a, the same category of emissions ambition, the world would heat more than four degrees by 2100. And it's the same for all of them. So an insufficient ranking would, is, is up to three degrees. So if all countries had an insufficient level of ambition, then the world would heat between two and three degrees. So how do they rank? Well, here's the table. So we have the same 15 in order from biggest to, to number 15. And you can see there that all but one country, India, have, emission, have NDCs that are not compatible with a two degree world. The US, Russia, and Saudi Arabia are critically insufficient uh, because their emissions, if extrapolated to the whole world, or their ambition would mean that we warm by more than four degrees. And we should note that these uh, you take into account historic emissions as well. It's not just based on current emissions. That's why China isn't the worst because some countries in the West in particular industrialized in the late 1800s and have been emitting carbon for a century or more. Whereas others like China, like Indonesia, uh, only have industrialized in the last 30, 40 years, perhaps, uh, if that. And so uh, we take into account historic emissions as well as current you know, emissions uh, to look at the, these rankings and then look at what the NDC actually is. The final thing to note here is that, that, is that column on the right. So will their policies meet this target? Um, you can see that some will, but others won't. So for example, Russia, even though it's critically insufficient, will meet it. Small praise because it's a critically insufficient target. Um, India, on the other hand, is the only sort of adequate performer. It's still not compatible with 1.5 degrees, which, as we'll see, will be still will still be incredibly damaging to the Pacific, but has a compatible two degree compatible rating and policies that meet it. If uh, this remains as it is, we will get to between 2.2 and 3.4 degrees of heating if all of these NDCs are met. A catastrophe for the Pacific. 
And this is another way of looking at it. So under the pledges and targets, this is where we'll get to by 2100 on this thermometer. This is where we are now. And this is the pre-industrial average. What's worse, however, is that on current policies, which is this bar here, it's even worse because many of these countries do not have the policies in place to meet the NDCs that they've committed to, Australia being one of them. Uh, and so under current policies, we're getting to 2.9 degrees of median warming and maybe up to 3.9 at the worst elements, so the, the worst um, uh, border of that model. And the projected harm, even under 1.5 degrees, is significant. Again, I'll let Genevieve speak more to this, but everything that we are seeing now will be worse. Sea levels will rise more. There will be worse uh, cyclones and extreme weather events. There will be more water stress, uh, not enough water to drink in many of these islands, um, and so on. The Pacific under 1.5 degrees of warming will be the worst affected of some of, of any of the regions in the world. So what should happen? Well, the Paris Agreement in 2015 um, recognized uh, that it's not enough. And so it has a ratchet mechanism where every five years countries are supposed to submit what their updated NDC will be, so better than the previous one. And the, because the agreement was signed in 2015, the current one, uh, the current round is due by the end of this year. So how have the top 15 emitters done? Well, this table shows you. None of the top 15 emitters have updated their nationally determined contribution. So they've said, nope, we're not going stronger than what we said five years ago. Uh, five of the top 15 emitters will not, they've said that they not, not only have they not updated it, but they will not update that target for the next five years. And this includes Australia, Japan, Russia, Indonesia, and USA, the ones in red here. Uh, which, you know, is essentially saying, well, we're going to leave the Pacific to its fate because we're not even going to try. Uh, a, a particularly, you know, I think morally repugnant position to take. And this finally is what it looks like. These are what the, the so-called emissions gaps. So I, I, I'm, I know I'm basically out of time, so I'll, I'll wrap it up here. But um, we're uh, currently on this trajectory, this black line. For us to get to a 1.5 degree compatible warming, this is how the reductions have to go to 2030. For us to get to a two degree level of warming, they, they can be a little bit more, we can emit a bit more. And the current policies and the pledges and targets take us in this direction. So as you can see, it is going completely the wrong way, which is why it's so important for the ambition to increase. So this is what we've, we've demanded that Australia does. The world needs to be more ambitious and they need to update these NDCs to a 1.5 degree uh, level of, of ambition. In Australia in particular, um, you know, we'll say, and this is our recommendation as part of this report based on the science, that we need net zero emissions by 2040. And that means 40 to 60% reduction by 2025 and a 60 to 80% reduction of Australia's emissions by 2030. Importantly, these should be accompanied by clear policies about how these will be met. It's worthless without a plan to do it. And then finally, two more things. Um, the Kyoto carryover credits uh, that Australia proposes to use to meet its Paris climate um, commitment, no other country proposes to do this. It's essentially a form of double counting. It must be abandoned. And Australia should act as a fair broker in the Pacific and argue at global climate summits for more action that, uh, you know, will protect um, and, and do justice to the, Pacific, the people of the Pacific that Scott Morrison, you know, claims to, to see as family with relation to Australia. So um, I will leave it there. Uh, that is a very quick overview of some of the key findings. But I think, you know, in conclusion, as you see on the screen there, um, it, we, we must recognize the, the role of Pacific Island nations and how they are at the forefront of this crisis, uh, but not responsible for it. We must recognize who the real people, who the real countries to blame are, and they must increase their ambition to a level uh, commensurate with a 1.5 degree world. And it, it must be done, you know, as soon as possible, but now certainly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicola. Look, I think this really gives us a sense of the urgency within which we're operating. And I have to, I have to admit the, the Paris Agreement is in many ways a, um, a sort of test for global governance as to whether or not this, this can work uh, in relation to such 
um, probably the most important issue that we are facing today. Um, so I really like the fact that the report identifies um, you know, not just who is emitting, but also whether what their targets are and um, and whether or not they've got policies that can meet them. Because I think it's very easy to be bamboozled by the types of statistics that politicians routinely invoke in relation to whether or not they are meeting which targets. Uh, and so this is really, really important for us uh, for us to, to grapple with and to, to understand. I'd now like to turn over to Jenny, who's going to um, give us more of um, more of an idea as to what the issues are, um, what people in the Pacific are facing, and um, and how they're dealing with it. I'd also like to state that there's some fantastic comments coming through in the chat. Um, if you do have some questions, do feel free to pop them in there. We will get to them once we get to the the Q and A section of the present of the of the evening's event. So over to you, Jenny. Thank you, Susan, and good evening, everyone. Um, I want to start by saying that it has been an absolute pleasure contributing to this report uh, and I hope that it will be used as a resource for not just uh, Pacific, uh, our Pacific communities but also those around the world. Uh, and to say I'm very grateful to those who lent their voices and their stories to this and I hope that we've done you justice. Um, I joined the climate movement after seeing how Pacific leaders were fighting in the lead up to the Paris Agreement negotiations. And I was inspired by Kathy Jetnil Kitchener's poem to the United Nations, Dia Matafele Binam. I am constantly reminded by Pacific Islanders everywhere of all that we need to protect. And today I stand on the shoulders of these giants to share our story, the reality of Pacific impacts and resilience. I come from a region of large ocean states covering a third of the Earth's surface. The strands of our Pacific mat include over 8 million people, 25,000 islands, and 1,200 indigenous languages, under threat from a crisis that they did not cause. On the front lines of the climate crisis, Pacific communities face loss and damage from increasingly intense impacts. Loss and damage encompasses climate impacts which go beyond a community's capacity to adapt. And this, include, this includes slow onset events such as sea level rise, warming oceans, ocean acidification, and salinization, as well as extreme weather events such as cyclones, flooding, and drought. And you will find examples of each of these uh, in the report as well as instances in which the Pacific has faced devastating events. In 2019, the Solomon Islands lost a significant amount of land, including five uninhabited islands and sections of land from six other islands, which was substantially eroded, forcing communities to relocate. Relocated families from one of these islands, Nuatambu, now live on a nearby larger island of Choi Sol, and what was once a single village is broken up into five separate communities, harming generations old relationship and kinship ties. Similarly, during the first week of April in 2020, Cyclone Herald devastated communities in the Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, Fiji, and Tonga, who were also implementing measures to protect from a global pandemic and face dual impacts from this. Loss and damage can also be categorized into economic and non-economic loss. And for the Pacific, this means that we are not only fighting for our survival, but we are fighting to protect intrinsic parts of our identity, cultural heritage, indigenous knowledge, history, language, for ourselves, but more especially for those who will come after us. You will see in the report how Pacific communities are building resilience through the case studies that we have shared. In Palau, women are reviving traditional farming practices to be self-sufficient and ensure traditional knowledge and practices are not forgotten. In Kiribati, communities are using keyhole gardens in response to limited land area. They are harvesting rainwater, building seawalls, and strengthening food security 
sharing their skills and experiences firsthand. In Tuvalu, young leaders are engaging in waste management and awareness raising. In Fiji, young leaders are strengthening capacity and leading on a number of climate issues. And communities are doing their best to ensure the least impacts from relocation. I will conclude with a quote from Gareth in the Solomon Islands, which I believe sums up perfectly why we need to move away from fossil fuels. He said, and I quote, those responsible for the crisis should not be afraid to walk away from something that does not work, unquote. Fossil fuels are not working. And you have heard why. Developed countries and major polluters must take the lead on a safe and just transition to renewable energy, ensuring that global temperature rise is limited to 1.5 degrees, giving the Pacific a chance to survive. Anything less is unacceptable. Thank you, and Vinatha. Thank you very much. Jenny and to all of the panelists. So we've now come to the interactive part of the, the evening's event. So um, I've got a few questions. Do feel free to put more questions in the chat. Um, yes, I see Marina, you have a question there. You're absolutely on my list. Um, this is to all panelists. So, uh, so we'll run through uh, the order perhaps of, uh, of the speakers. Uh, Marina's question is, um, you know, what, what is the projection for 2050 if we continue on the same trajectory? So um, do you want to run through um, from Joe to Nicola, then to, to Jenny? Do you, do you all want to, uh, want to have a stab at that question or would you prefer to, uh, to delegate? Um, yeah, sure. Um, I think uh, for the actual science of it, I would, uh defer to our report writers, the ones that did the research, but only to say that uh, we don't have to wait until 2050 to really feel the impacts of climate change in the Pacific. Um, we are feeling it now. And if we continue on this current trajectory, by, by the time 2050 rolls around, it's already too late for many of us. Thanks, Jeff. Nicola? Uh, we don't have specific projections for 2050 in the report. Um, uh, I think it can, in terms of specific amounts of warming, you know, you can calculate the, uh, approximately what it would be per year by 2100 and then divide it by the number of years between now and then to get to 2050, if you know what I mean, you can do the arithmetic. But the problem with this is that um, it's probably going to be an exponential level of warming because of the feedback loops that occur. So really anybody that's trying to say exactly how much it will be in one year or another between now and then is probably being more specific than it is possible to be. Uh, and that's why in the report we have that range of potential warming because the way that you know climate scientists figure this out is they have a model then you put a various different inputs into it and then it provides you with a range of possible outcomes and when it comes to temperature it's within that you know one you know, 1.5 degrees and we look at the median number which is 2.7 or 2.9 on the um based on current indices versus policies that are in place um so suffice it to say though that when we're talking about the pacific even 1.5 degrees of warming is too much. Um, it's true for the whole world, but for the Pacific in particular, because of the impacts that that will have on rising sea levels, most coral uh, in, in the oceans will be dead by that point. Um, and so uh, it, the, the conclusion remains the same. Um, we, we know that it will be worse by 2050 than it will be by 2030. Um, so uh, th there's no time to waste in, in rapidly uh, reducing global emissions. Fantastic. Thanks, Nicola. And Jenny, I mean, obviously, when we talk about targets um, and, you know, what sort of levels we're hitting and we're sitting within certain bands, obviously, there's regional variation. Do you want to comment on that? I think Nicola has summed it up quite well. Um, but just to say that 2050, if we continue on the same track, could really mean um, that the Pacific doesn't exist. And that is not something that we want. We want to be able to, to continue living in our homes. We want to be able to continue teaching our children um, about all, all the amazing, the heritage, the history that we have, and that that is something that we should work towards. 
Thank you very much. So I've also got a question here from Anna Paulina, um, and this is open to the panel. So whoever, which, whichever of you would like to take this, uh, do, do chime in. Um, she's asking a question about um, what are the impacts on um, Aboriginal and Tor Torres Strait Islanders and uh, who will be disproportionately affected by accelerating climate change? And why, why aren't we hearing about that? Climate change doesn't affect all people equally. Um, and we know, as, uh, as the, the, um, the, the question states, I mean, it's, it's, it's very true that um, Indigenous Australians and will be, be some of the worst affected when it comes to Australia. Um, and in a, in a similar, although slightly different sense, um, that people of the Pacific, uh, on the, you know, Pacific Island countries, are in a similar kind of frontline position when it comes to the impacts of climate change. Um, our allies, uh, I, I believe at 350.org, are currently uh, working uh, to, to, with Torres Strait Islander people uh, to on their struggle for climate justice. Um, I'm not sure if we have anybody from that organization on this call, but I, I would you know, do, you know, suggest that, that um, their resources and their campaign would be a good place to go. Um, but it goes you know, without uh, question um, that uh, those um, that the injustice of climate change is most uh, acutely seen in the impacts that it has on uh, First Nations people, uh, and that is the case in Australia and elsewhere. I've got some fantastic comments in the chat. These are all really excellent. Do feel free to um, please keep them keep them coming. I'm just scrolling up. We've got Madeline Taylor from the Sydney Environment Institute who would like the panel to comment on whether any of the international climate change programs in the Pacific, like the Green Climate Fund, are creating any meaningful changes to protect and safeguard the Pacific. Uh, would any of our panelists like to answer that? I think the best way to ascertain just the effects, well, the, the what do you call it, the impact that these uh, programs are making in the Pacific is actually to have a look and to come and have a look in the region. So the Green Climate Fund is an important uh, part of how, well, an important way for the Pacific to access funds for things like adaptation projects, mitigation projects, and that sort of thing that's, you know, um, not so really uh, available from say traditional donor partners, need partners and that sort of thing. So just speaking from my own context here in Samoa, it's, you can definitely see how um, the Green Climate Fund has really been assisting with our adaptation efforts. Uh, you drive around the island, you see the sea walls going up, you see a whole lot of different projects um, going up in the region, uh, which is also why you know, some of these top 15 emitter countries should continue and up their contributions to the Green Climate Fund because that is really what we are using uh, now to adapt to this crisis that's not of our making. Thank you very much, Joe. And I think you're right. I think there is room for um, countries like Australia to provide um, their share in terms of uh, addressing a global problem and being able to help uh, countries that need uh, that need the assistance, those that are most vulnerable to climate change. So I've got a question here from Len Cordner, who says that Australia has often used the argument that we are just 1% of global emissions. So what can we do that will have meaningful impact? Maybe the best way is to set a framework for the dialogue, is to articulate what it is that the Pacific nations have as targets and to progress towards those objectives. If these small nations have ambitious targets and are achieving meaningful prog prog uh, progress, it would sandwich countries like Australia. What do we think of this as a sort of um, political manoeuvre? Yeah, so essentially it's asking whether or not um, we should be trying to move towards meeting Pacific Island targets um, and use that as a framework. So if we've got countries that are the most vulnerable and that have the most... Um, have the strongest, clearest targets internationally, that this could be used in order to demand that countries like Australia have more ambitious targets? Well, I mean, the target set forward by Pacific countries is obviously the benchmark, but uh, we also understand that every country is different in its own right. There are different economic factors and all that sort of thing in play. Um, but yeah, I mean, that would be nice. Like, uh, for example, the Marshall Islands have already submitted their second round of nationally determined contributions. Or these are uh, what countries um, pledge 
uh, how they will contribute to cutting down their emissions. Most countries have only um, given their preliminary ones, if, um, but the, the Pacific countries are already kind of moving ahead. So whether Australia can um, adopt or whether Australia can kind of uh, use the targets of the Pacific use will be great. But, you know, when you've got a powerful fossil fuel and coal lobby industry in the, in the country that obviously makes um, any kind of ambition, uh, ambitious target hard to set, let alone trying to meet the Pacific ones. So I've got a, a comment, uh, a question here from Vanilla Tupu. Um, is it reasonable to assume that in today's political and economic climate that the Australian government will agenda set Pacific climate change? If not, how can we ensure that the necessary changes are enacted and the targets are reached? So I guess this is really a question about how we can change that narrative. Australia has the potential to do a lot of great things for the Pacific. And those are the things that you know, we've recommended in that final sort of solutions part of the report. Um, I, you know, it may seem um, implausible that Australia with, with its current federal government will, will do that. But from, from what we know, um, the rhetoric from the government and from Scott Morrison in particular about, you know, wanting to be a friend to the Pacific is genuine, except it just doesn't extend to climate. Um, so unfortunately, because climate is the biggest uh, threat to the Pacific, it's a relatively empty position. Um, but Australia does have a, a significant potential to do this. Um, we have always, uh, throughout Australia's history, act as, as a kind of middle power, been more influential than one might expect uh, when it comes to international forums. Um, you know, we were one of the signing members of the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights um, and many other examples that, that we could point to. Um, we, we do have the potential uh, if we had a, you know, if the current government uh, was, was more ambitious on climate or, or if we had a, a different government that, that was um, to, to play that role. Um, and I think some of the international moves that, that we're seeing from other major powers or from other from major powers, I should say, um, are cause for cautious optimism. So, you know, the uh, as um, the, in the foreword of our report by Enele Sopoaga, who's the former prime minister of Tuvalu and the current opposition leader says, the return, as he, put, he puts it, the return to sanity in the United States um, mm. is cause for optimism. Uh, Joe Biden's policies on climate actually are the most ambitious of any American president or presidential candidate with the exception of you know, um, some third party candidates that never had a chance of being elected. Um, so, and, and that's genuine because of the pressure that civil society put on his um, campaign. Uh, so that combined with some of the, the announcements that China has made recently, more countries apart from the US and China committing to net zero by 2050. This creates a global diplomatic situation where more countries might do what France has already threatened to do, which is impose concrete penalties on countries that do not meet their Paris commitments. The French, I think about a year ago, said that they would um, impose trade tariffs or, or trade uh, penalties on countries that did not live up to their Paris climate agreement commitments at the way that they themselves had, had, had said that they would do. So there is there is hope there because, you know, diplomacy is, is slow, but when there's enough critical mass, it can be very difficult for a country of Australia's size to resist that pressure. Thank you very much for that, Nicola. Like I can see that there's some questions gathering steam in, in the chat right now. Um, I, there's two things I wanna pull out from, from the comments that people are making. And um, one is, is really perhaps again to all of you uh, on the panel about whether or not, and, and this is a comment uh, question from, uh, from, from Luke, I think, um, who's, who questioned whether or not, well, the entire capitalist system is based on extraction, uh, including the financial system. Is, is it at all possible to have meaningful change when, uh, when, when the economic system just doesn't incorporate the impacts, um, the environmental impacts of, of, of extraction? I think that it is, it is possible. So the, the current economic system the, the current economic system and the way that it's built is, is focused towards extract, extraction and individualism. It's profit over people. But I think people, um, 
everywhere and young leaders in particular, those who will be uh, the leaders of tomorrow and who are transitioning are recognizing that this is not something that is going to work for everyone. This is not a just system. And are already putting forward um, alternatives like the circular economy. So I think ideas are certainly out there and I think that people are working towards it and we must, um, we must uh, continue to, to ramp them up and give them the, the space to, to do that work. Thanks, Genevieve. Look, I think this is really important. We've got a, a question from Lyndon, which I think harks back to Nicola, what you were just saying about how can we affect real change in countries like Australia, uh, which seem to be very much focused on uh, e even even their uh, attempt to recover from, from COVID is, is sort of gas-led, fossil fuel-led. Um, do you want to comment on, you, you mentioned diplomacy is slow, but it can affect change. Is there something that we could be doing here in Australia to, to try and change that, again, that narrative uh, of the major political parties. Just to be clear, Susan, the, the narrative being that we need fossil fuels for a COVID recovery? The, yeah, the narrative being that we will transition, but that transition still has fossil fuels. Yeah, so that's something that is just completely wrong. Uh, it, it's incorrect on the latest science and on where technology is headed. We don't need fossil fuels for a COVID recovery. We don't need fossil fuels for a flourishing 21st century economy. And we can see this because there are countries around the world that are getting close to 100% renewables. Um, the whole state of Tasmania in Australia is now 100% renewables. The ACT is basically the same. South Australia is something like 60%. Um, and the technology is there. It's also now cheaper uh, in many cases to build new wind and solar compared to new fossil fuel plants, let alone gas, which is some of the most expensive um, of any kind of electricity generation. So anybody who's making that argument either um, doesn't have the latest data or is making it in bad faith in order to advance the cause of fossil fuels uh, you know, at the expense of climate action and at the expense of the people of the Pacific and others around the world that are on the front line of damage when coal, uh, oil and gas are burned to create electricity. I want to keep this discussion going um, because I think it's really important. We've got a comment from uh, or a question from Ed Miles here in the chat. So really asking about whether or not the figure for China, 23% increase due to its own CO2 emissions. Is that a large extent due to the US, Germany and other major exporting countries using China and as its manufacturing center? So this is really getting to the question of, you know, the fact that we are in a globalized economy. Have the other major industrialized countries simply outsourced their emissions? Is this what we're seeing? So just to be clear on that figure, um, it's a 23% of total annual emissions, not a 23% increase. So that, that's how much of all of the emissions that are you know, emitted each year come from China as opposed to other countries. The short answer to your question is yes. Uh, the way that emissions are calculated means that emissions that you send overseas don't count. So for example, Australia only counts our emissions from domestic coal burned for electricity and steel, but we're the world's biggest coal exporter. So when that coal is sent overseas, it is burnt by countries that use it to make their own steel and electricity, but the emissions count, they count as their emissions, not ours. And the same applies for all manufactured goods that are not manufactured by the country that they're eventually bought and used in. And so because China has essentially become the factory of the world over the last 20, 30 years, um, many, yes, you're right, many countries have essentially outsourced their emissions. If they were to manufacture all the things at home that they get, uh, that they import from China, their emissions would be much greater. Um, now, uh, there's many other reasons for China's increase in emissions, including their, you know, uh, they are industrializing, their level standard of living is, is going up. Um, and these are many of these are good things, actually. Um, you know, there's hundreds of millions of people that have been pulled out of poverty in China because of that industrialization and that economic development. The point is not that in itself it's bad. The point is that it can be done cleanly through renewable energy uh, and um, you know, there, there are bigger questions there around the, the nature of growth and, and, and so on and, and whether, you know, we can continue to grow economies endlessly in a finite world. Uh, that's, a, that's a separate topic. But um, yes, uh, this is why uh, we look at historic emissions and not just current emissions when we look at uh, how sufficient the NDCs are for each of the countries in the reports ranking.
Thanks very much, Nicola. Look, I've, I've got um, uh, some very keen participants that really want to hear more about the types of strategies that we can use to address this problem. And, and Joe, I want to come to you and then go to go to Jenny. Um, Joe, the the um, some of the comments coming up are whether or not we should be using legal strategies and promoting um, the uh, the idea of criminalising ecocide is something that. Is that something that gets discussed or debated in the Pacific or, or with Greenpeace as a, as a strategy? Um, what I can say is that we are exploring uh, every uh, legal pathway that we can. Um, we haven't touched on ecocide, although that is all part of the cumulative case that we're trying to build. Um, and that is with regards to, you know, what, what can, um, what are the legalities around the destruction of biodiversity and that sort of thing and the impacts of one country's um, uh, emissions and, and, and fossil fuel industries and that sort of thing on, on the other. So definitely the legal pathway is one that we are exploring. It's one of the priority areas of uh, our campaign. And, uh, you know, partly because of COVID, things have had to slow down, but there are um, things in the pipeline that we are exploring uh, as we head into the new year. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Joe. Jenny, I, I want to come to you now. Um, could you tell us or give us some examples uh, that, that uh, are in the report about how communities are responding uh, to, uh, to the adverse um, effects, the multiplier effects of climate change, in, including the slow onset, um, the slow onset effects, but also um, the, the catastrophic um, extreme weather events? Thank you, Susan. Communities uh, in the Pacific are responding in many different ways. And for a lot of the work that I've been seeing and that um, I've had, I've been able to be involved in, it's Pacific communities coming together to support each other. It's um, using traditional knowledge and indigenous science and to, um, to strengthen homes and and um, seawalls to use traditional practices for farming uh, to ensure that there is self-sufficiency the the pacific communities are using the historical knowledge that they have gained um, over thousands of years to continue fighting and to continue surviving and this is something that we must absolutely protect um, one of the one of the areas in which I've seen this resilience has been in, in relocation and cases where communities are already being relocated. In Fiji, uh, Vuni Dongaloa and uh, Narikoso is currently in the process of relocation. And even though these communities um, shouldn't have to move and oftentimes do not want to move, they recognize that this is um, something that they need to do for the future of their community. Um, and they are trying to find ways to, to accept um, and to build off of that. And I think that that truly shows uh, the incredible survival of the Pacific is that communities sometimes don't know uh, that this is happening because of climate change. They, can't, they know that something is changing, but they don't know that it's climate change. Um, but they also know that this they have to address it, then they have to find a different way of, of facing these impacts of why you have king tides coming in, why do you have coastal erosion? And they are working towards um, a, much, a much better future. They are trying. And I think that uh, countries like Australia have the responsibility of ensuring that this will happen. Thanks very much, Jenny. Uh, I think we've got a question here from Lagi uh, Torbal. Um, this is uh, to you, Joe, um, about um, the realm of power and power governance structures. Um, so he's uh, he's stating that the report really shows well the political will and actions of emitted countries is critical. Um, is power on your radar? and in the sphere of your campaign. So um, this is, uh, so essentially what, um, what the question is pertaining to is the narrative strand of your work, Joe, 
um, which you're alluding to is so important to the position of the Pacific, not as victims, not as smaller or vulnerable, and all of those labels that um, sort of seek to suppress the voices and interests of Pacific Islanders. So the question, Joe, is can you share a bit about your changing, how you're changing the narrative around the Pacific? Yeah, well, part of the way that we address the power imbalance and what fuels the power imbalance are these uh, narratives about the region. So we need to address those narratives to address um, or to help address these power imbalances, because for a long time, these kind of narratives have fed these power imbalances. And so, um, for instance, you know, you have... Um, if you continually perpetuate the Pacific as nothing more than you know, these people who are in, um, just on the front lines of uh, climate change, who are, you know, just broken seawalls and, and cyclones and that sort of thing, you, you are disempowering uh, the region and its people. You are not looking at, you know, what the region brings. You know, I always say that we're not only on the front lines of climate change, we're on the forefront of climate action. And you can see that, I mean, not many people know but the Paris Agreement is a result of our Pacific diplomats and civil society. And you know, when when the world, um, when those big powers got into a gridlock, it was the Pacific that kind of broke that and, and got us um, the Paris Agreement and got 1.5 across the line. So when we look at telling the stories of the region, we're very intentional with making sure that we're not just kind of telling this victim narrative. Yes, we are, um, you know suffering the impact of that but we have to balance that out with what well we are you know affected by climate change but look at what we're doing and as you, as you see in the report and as i said earlier you know we are punching well above our weight uh having to negotiate at these larger forums with bigger countries and yet being able to pull off you know the paris agreement coming through uh setting these ambitious targets and that sort of thing those are the stories that you need to always kind of um partner with that other um, side of thing. And you need to present the whole story uh, so that you can get an accurate look. And then just in terms of power, I mean, that's that's how this power imbalance has kind of been perpetuated. It's just holding this false narrative, this hopeless narrative over us. And it just become mainstream for, for a lot of people's thinking. So for us that operate in the region, we have to consistently remind people that there is a wider, there is a more holistic narrative that we need to present bearing in mind as well that this is not something new the pacific didn't just decide um, yesterday to become environmentalists we have always been environmentalists because our cultures um, are premised on an integrated relationship with the environment every proverb that you hear when you come to samoa and, and i'm sure for a lot of islands a lot of our wisest uh, people and and and, and the the traditional knowledge and proverbs are all environmentally based. They all refer to the ocean or to the environment or that sort of thing. So we're not new to this. This has been part of the makeup of a Pacific person for a long time. And then we need to present that because those, uh, this traditional knowledge, this way of thinking now is the way that will chart the path forward. The world now is only catching up and deciding, oh, we need to look at sustainable solutions and that sort of thing. And that's something that we've modeled for a long time. So yeah, it's very important that to address that, we need to present um, complete narratives and not extractive ones. Thanks, Joe. I think that's just so important to identify the diplomatic weight that the Pacific Islands have in uh, in climate diplomacy. Um, Jenny, I just want to come back to you because um, you identified a range of different practices um, in the Pacific of people responding to to um, to climate change. Um, is a lot of what you're seeing coming from the grassroots, or is it coming from from Pacific Island governments? Thank you, Susan. From what I've seen, it's a combination of both. And in the Pacific, we uh, very much work together and work in collaboration. And it's uh, because of um, because of how small the community often is. Uh, grassroots and government um, provide a link to to communities on the front line who are facing impacts and work together to ensure that they are getting the right resources, that they are getting the support that they need, um, that they're able to, to build their resilience. So I think in a lot of ways, we work together, not just across institutions, 
and um, governments and organizations and grassroots, but also intergenerationally, young leaders working with elders in order to create um, a, a really a comprehensive response to this problem. That's really great. Look, I think um, we've got some fantastic loads of loads of questions coming in the chat. So hold on to your seats. Uh, we've got some time yet. So I want to move now to um, to the, the question here from Tim and maybe Nicola, you can answer this question. Um, one of the one of the only ways to make a big meaningful shift is that the cost of renewable energy and storage uh, technology has to become superior in both price and performance. So they're asking you uh, when we'll reach this tipping point in 10, 20, 50 or 100 years. I think we're already there, aren't we, Nicola? We are. Um, <clears throat> the tipping point has already been passed, certainly when it comes to existing, uh, sorry, new generation, and in many cases for existing generation as well. Um, it was the case maybe 10 years ago that what's called, this will be a little bit of a technical thing, but bear with me, what's called the levelized cost of electricity was higher for renewables than for coal and, and oil and gas. Um, what levelized cost of electricity means that when you, if, you, if you are about to build two new two power plants, one says wind and one is coal, you take all of the costs that it requires to build them and run them for, for their lifetime, and all of the cost of the fuel, which in the case of the solar farm or the wind farm is zero, and then you work out what eat, how much a unit of electricity produced by that plant over its lifetime would be. It's a way of comparing like for like when it comes to different technologies, right? And so the levelized cost of electricity for uh, renewables has been going down and down and down, whereas for coal, oil and gas, it's pretty much the same because we're really using the same technology we were using 50 or 100 years ago almost. Not quite the same, but you know, the principle is the same. And that has now basically we've, we've passed that tipping point now not everywhere and not in the same way obviously different places have different amounts of wind and solar resources but anyone that tells you that it's 10 or 20 years away as i said before doesn't either doesn't have the latest data or is making a bad faith argument um so we're, we're already there that, that's that's the short version of, of uh of, of the answer there um, certainly early you know 10 20 years ago we weren't um, and people made predictions back then that, oh, it'll never happen. But one thing that has happened very clearly is the cost of renewables uh, has just been going, been going down and down and down. And because the fuel that they use is free, uh, wind and solar, um, as opposed to coal uh, and, and oil and gas, uh, it's not uh, subject to the vagaries and manipulations of the global commodity markets. Thanks very much, Nicola. I, th I think you're absolutely right. And you can certainly check out the International Renewable Energy Agency uh, gives up to date reports on where we're at in terms of uh, in terms of international take up of renewable energy and what we need to do. Um, Joe, we've got a question here. You might want to take it, but also open to Jenny about what New Zealand is doing for the Pacific and can it be used as leverage in Australia? Uh, do you want to take that one? Yeah, New Zealand has been uh, quite interesting, kind of like the middleman between the Pacific and um, and Australia. They have been, um, I mean, they, 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 they've, they've done quite a lot. I mean, in, in, in fairness to them and in comparison to others, there is still a lot more that they can do. But with regards to its position, uh, uh, trying to influence Australia or pressure Australia, that, that remains to be seen. Um, obviously, at the last Pacific Island Forum, New Zealand Prime Minister was quite uh, vocal with her support for uh, Pacific Island countries trying to get more ambitious language in the regional declarations, which Scott Morrison was blocking. Um, but, you know, that that's an interesting geopolitical or diplomatic uh, issue between New Zealand and Australia. I don't know to what extent that New Zealand has used that. Uh, there are obviously a lot of issues between the two countries which New Zealand prioritizes over its own relationships with Pacific countries. So it remains to be seen, but at least publicly, New Zealand has shown uh, a lot of support for Pacific countries. Um, it's what they do behind closed doors that, uh, that remains to be seen. I think Joe has summed it up really well. Um, yes, New Zealand has been doing um, some really great things and they've got amazing leadership and but there's always uh, more that, that can be done, particularly around um, pushing for their counterparts uh, 
developed countries to, to do more and to be more ambitious in the climate, climate space. I'm going to slip in just one final question. We've just had so many, um, so many fantastic questions in the chat, but staying with you, Jenny, if that's all right. Um, the question is, is it too early to, uh, to talk about um, relocation for people in the Pacific? Is this, is this something that is uh, talked about, discussed? Is it, is it a normal um, every, part of the everyday discussion or is this um, something that, that people aren't willing to, to entertain? Thanks, Susan. Um, it's definitely not too early. This is conversation and discussion that has been ongoing for, for quite a while as countries start to realize that this may be a reality. And we come, we come at it from the point that this, that relocation um, migration is seen as a last resort for many and that um, those who have to or choose to do so should be able to with dignity. Um, but for many in the Pacific, this is not something that people want to do. There is a intrinsic connection um, to the land as Joe was saying earlier and to the ocean where we come from. People don't want to leave their ancestral burial grounds. They don't want to leave their historical homes. And they, they don't want to have their children grow up in a place that is unfamiliar. Um, what that means for, for governments is that now there are conversations around what may happen or what will need to happen. And uh, Fiji has come out with relocation guidelines and displacement guidelines. There has been um, discussion as well um, in Australia around uh, the former uh, Australian Prime Minister Kevin Rudd saying that Australia should accept citizens from Tuvalu or Kiribati in exchange for control of their EEZ, uh, their exclusive economic zones and marine resources. And I think that this is a, a very short-sighted view of, of the climate conversation and, and of migration and displacement because this essentially is something that is neo-colonial. It's benefiting of pain that you are causing and is not something that should be entertained. So I think that the, the migration um, debate and conversation should, should happen very carefully. It is something that we need to keep in mind and need to possibly be discussing given the extent of disasters, but also recognizing that this is not something um, that should be seen as a solution. Uh, we are, we've come to the end of the, the question and answer segment of the evening's event. So I'm going to uh, turn first to, to David Richard, but then back to, back to Joe to help uh, close our event. So um, I'd like to turn now to uh, the CEO of Greenpeace Australia Pacific, David Ritter, on, uh, with a few words on what the report means and the next steps, because I know people in the chat are, are eagerly um, awaiting what, what the next actions are. So over to you, David. Thank you so much, Susan. And it has been just terrific listening to the vibrant conversation and trying to follow the, the multi-channel nature of that conversation as we do in the 21st century. Um, look, first of all, I just need to say a huge thank you to, to Joe, uh, to Jenny and to Nicola for what is really an extraordinary piece of work. Uh, thank you for, for this piece that you have led, all that you have done, all that you have contributed to it, not just with your expertise, but with your heart. Um, and I thank also the whole Greenpeace team that has been behind you. Um, I, I am, it is such a privilege to work for an organisation like Greenpeace and to serve the Greenpeace, the climate, the environment movement. And part of that um, great privilege is just working with absolutely fantastic people. So thanks to everyone who contributed to uh, getting this report uh, out in the world and done. Thanks too to you, Susan, as well, for your expert uh, handling of this evening. Every Zoom call is its own challenge and thank you for handling this. It was really fantastically exciting to see uh, around 550 people registered for this evening, which I'm, I'm told is a record for an SEI event. And of course, you don't expect that everyone who is registered will, will come along, but that creates an instant community of people, of 550 people who we can talk 
uh, with about what the next steps are. It's a terrific result, a credit to all. So thank you for that. And to all of our colleagues at the Sydney Environment Institute, you know, one of the ways that we will steer our way through these crazy climate emergency times is through strong collaboration. And let me just express how much we value the collaborative work with the Sydney Environment uh, Institute. Um, thanks too to all of those who gave of their heart and their experience to appear in the report, uh, the informants. I'll say a little bit more about those stories in a moment, but just to express that gratitude. And finally, to express the gratitude to the very, very distinguished panel of referees who are listed at the front of the report, uh, not only some extraordinary academics from uh, the Sydney Environment Institute, but leaders from within the Pacific Island uh, community and leaders from within the, the broad Australian business community. So a wonderful faculty of referees who looked over the report and made it stronger. So we've all seen the report and just how incredible it is. And it would be really easy to be numbed by the figures that appear in there, to be stunned into inaction by the graphs and by the trajectories. But I am full of confidence that that is not gonna happen that we are not going to be numbed into inaction. Because how can you not look into the eyes and the faces of the people who are the beating heart of that report and not instead want to rise to your feet and grab the nearest megaphone you can to demand a different world? That is what the stories in this report, I believe, invite us to do, to imagine a different world of a return to full flourishing for Pacific Island communities. I think that is the promise of the fight that comes out of the Pacific. And we heard Joe's incredibly strong words about the stories that are the truth of that remarkable, enormous part of our beautiful, beautiful planet. And if there are four words that I love the most in that report, and there are many words that I love in that report, the four words I love the most are the final words. The time is now. The time is now. And so what is the time now for? Well, Thank you, Genevieve from SEI for dropping the link into uh, the chat a few times. Go to the report. If you haven't read it, read it, soak it up, share it, urge other people to read it. Feel free to share it with whatever decision makers you like. So go to the report, share the report. Then on the page, sign that petition that sends that letter to Scott Morrison, demanding that he be a decent leader of a Pacific Island nation. That is what Australia is, a decent leader. So sign that petition and share it with others. And then when we're back next year, just a little bit of a teaser, the next really big piece of content that is coming out to make this case is a terrific documentary that again, Joe has been stewarding, one of, the, one of the hardest working people I know that Joe has been stewarding. There'll be a remarkable documentary coming out uh, in scheduled for the middle of January that is the next phase in storytelling. The time is now, the time is now. Thank you. Thank you so much, David, for those words. And I'd like to um, move, uh, pass it over now to Joe to give some closing statements on behalf of the Pacific. Um, well, th thanks for that, Susan. And thank you for that stirring call to action, David. I think I just wanna, again, um, reiterate um, your sentiments and thank Nicola and, and, and Genevieve for you know really steering this work to Susan and the team, uh, Genevieve, at, um, at SEI and especially for everyone who is on this call now 
for you know taking the time out of your evening because um you know as we discussed today this report and as um if you read the report the uh, the forward is uh one of the forward uh, was written by uh, the former prime minister of Tuvalu and he said that this report is just another arrow in our quiver and i think that's important to understand that because while you know we're celebrating the release of the report you know the work has to continue and as david has said the time is now and so i would urge all of you uh you know who get off this call later on to not only read the report but reflect on what it really means and i said as i said earlier you know this is a question about not just uh your know, politics and that sort of thing there's people at stake here there are there are cultures there's an entire uh, you know a quarter of the world is now or a third of the world service surface comprises the pacific and so you know when you think about climate change think about the people who are most likely affected we are you know the currently the human faces of climate change but if we don't do anything soon as australia um got a taste of it we're all going to be it so you know um and you know one of the things that jenny touched on was our connection to our our land the funny thing is in samoa the same word for placenta uh placenta and land mean are the same word and when we are born our placenta is buried into the land so that really signifies just how important the struggle is it's not just about uh saving land or saving uh you know whatever it's the people this question this issue is fundamentally an, a question about the dignity and the, the rights of us to all live in dignity uh and for future generations as well so thank you all again um thank you for your uh, solidarity with us here in the region please do read the report and uh all best and take care to all of you after Thank you very much, Joe. So it, it, it's my role now to bring this event to a close. Um, thank you to our experts and to our audiences for joining and participating in today's event and to Greenpeace Australia Pacific and the Sydney Environment Institute for bringing us all together. To access the Pacific report, refer to the link that's been posted in the chat, or you can, of course, head to the Greenpeace Australia Pacific website. Post event, we will be, uh, we will, we will be um, forwarding the link as well as a recording of today's discussion. So if you miss part of it or you wanna hear it again, or you wanna hear that rousing speech by, by David Ritter as a call to action and uh, Joe and Jenny and Nicola's words, uh, please, please do so, do look out for that. Um, to stay up to date for um, upcoming events and news that is coming out of the Sydney Environment Institute, you can, of course, subscribe uh, to our monthly newsletter via the website or follow us on Twitter at SEI-Sydney. Um, and we hope to see you at future events and be well and good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.